from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans. We are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word, another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. Today is Friday, December 4th, 2020, and we have a powerhouse program, a lot to bring to you today. We're going to begin with a tribute to December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Then we're going to center our program around the Constitution and the changes that are taking place in America. We'll tie it beginning with the Supreme Court, and we'll bring our nuggets portion into the 1260 days that the Bible talks about in Revelation. And we're actually going to bring that and show that how it all ties into the Constitution and why there's so much effort to change the Constitution of the United States. All right, so before we do, let's bring you up with a, a few a little short stories. First of all, the Internet seems to be working for us. Two weeks in a row, we've done, so we got a, we got a trend going here. Two weeks in a row after almost three months. It, so it looks like we can uh, live stream right now confidently that we'll be out there. So if you don't have services to go to on the Sabbath, we hope that you'll put us on your calendar to tune in to our program right here as we stream every Saturday at 1 o'clock uh, church services. All right, let's get into a couple short stories here. Gunmen assassinate Iran's top nuclear scientists in an ambush, provoking a new crisis. Is this going to be the new wave and the new trend that we're going to go back to after not seeing a lot of this for the last four years? Iran's top nuclear scientist, long identified by American Israeli intelligence, is the guiding figure behind a covert effort in a design to design an atomic warhead, was shot and killed Friday in what the Iranian media called a roadside ambush as he and his bodyguards traveled outside of Tehran. So now, as the change is coming in the administration, is this the effort that Israel is going to go back to to slow down the nuclear proliferation in Iran itself? Is we talk about going back to the deal that the Trump administration came out, slowing down the nuclear development in Iran. So now, at the following of the assassination, Iran's supreme leader vows revenge on the top nuclear scientist apparently that was assassinated. So the killing of the nuclear scientists, this is according to Gatestone says, that it's going to actually save countless lives. Under the slogan, Death to America, Iran has been at war with the U.S., Israeli, Israel, and with their Western allies since the revolution in 1979. They've been using proxy groups to kill hundreds of Americans in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, and other places to launch terror attacks across the Middle East, Europe, the U.S., and in Latin America. So what Israel is trying to do is dismantle and continue to slow down the development of a nuclear weapon. Iran says they don't have them. Israel says that the, what they're trying to do. So you have seen this past summer explosions just all over, all over Iran in the areas where they're developing nuclear uh, power. And so now we see their top scientists, they took him out. They're trying to slow down any possibility of them having a nuclear weapon. So we'll keep on top of this. But this is going to ignite a new retaliation that we're going to begin seeing probably now in the next four years or more. Iran, it says, this is from, from uh, Gatestone, Iran will never abandon what it considers its absolute right to become a nuclear armed state, not under the current regime, nor at any future regime. It has lied to the IAEA and archive and even sets out in detail the ways in which it has deceived the inspectors. So we're going to keep an eye on this. And what we're going to see now with the new administration coming in is the proliferation around the world of the instability of keeping the peace like we've been, we've been witnessing now in recent years. So... It's going to be a change. We're going to be talking about some of these, and I'm going to talk about some of these changes actually this Sabbath in a sermon that I'm going to be giving. It's in, uh, I believe I've got the title. is called The Nation Who Got What It Asked For. I'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the program. All right, so now let's begin our program today with this. December 7th, 1941, the day that shook the world, and as 
Our president back then said it was a day that lived in infamy, December 7th, 1941. All right, so let's play a little tribute here and tell us a little bit about Pearl Harbor. Senators and representatives, I have the distinguished honor of presenting the President of the United States. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. We've played that clip now.
pretty much every year since we began uh, God's Unchanged Word, News Nuggets and Insights, and we intend to play that every year as a tribute, as a reminder of what takes place so that we don't forget our history because today our history books are being changed. If you go to many places in Europe, you'll find out that the prison camps and the annihilation of the Jews back then in World War II never existed, according to many history books. So we're not going to change the history of our nation right here at God's Unchanging Word. The USS Arizona is probably the most famous of the ships that were at Pearl Harbor because of the monument that took place and because of so many people who actually died on that ship. She sits at the bottom of the harbor right now as a national museum, and actually this is an air shot, and you can see the boat itself underneath the water where it sits since it has been sunk. We've got another video here, it's a real short video, just a, I think two, three minutes long, of the actual footage at the moment it was bombed in Pearl Harbor. Let's play that. She was the biggest thing any of us had ever seen, and each of us stood in awe. The battleship was indeed a floating giant, a 30,000-ton armored fortress that was two football fields long with guns that could fire a shell 12 miles. When the Arizona's keel was laid to begin construction, the ship was going to be the biggest of any navies in the world. But that was in March 1914, before the start of World War I. A quarter century later, as it sat anchored in Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7, 1941, the majestic Arizona was obsolete. Yet it was about to become the most famous ship in the history of the U.S. Navy. The Arizona was not supposed to be in Hawaii that morning. It was scheduled to return to the West Coast for an overhaul in late November 1941. But on October 22nd, while out on maneuvers in bad weather, it collided with another battleship and was badly damaged. It would have to stay in Pearl Harbor through December for repairs. Shortly before 8 a.m. on December 7th, a Navy doctor named Eric Hackinson was standing on the deck of the hospital ship USS Solis, filming Sunday morning activities in the harbor. Suddenly, a speedboat raced by and a huge bomb splashed in the water right behind it. Hackinson's camera swept across the harbor and paused on the Arizona when the ship erupted in a gigantic series of explosions. A huge jet of black smoke shot into the air and the front quarter of the ship disappeared in a shower of blasts like fireworks going crazy. Hackinson had caught the moment of the great ship's death. On board, dozens of sailors were blown up or burned to death. Of the 1,500 on board, only 334 got off the ship alive. 900 of those killed would never be recovered. As the Arizona settled in the shallow water of Pearl Harbor, smoke billowed from the wreckage and from the burning fuel oil that had leaked out and caught fire on the surface. In the aftermath of the Japanese attack, the United States entered World War II and much of the Arizona was eventually dismantled. But its hull was left where it sank as a hallowed memorial to all those who perished that day. And 75 years later, the big ship still bleeds a little oil now and then, which drifts up from the wreck and stains the surface of the water. That's amazing. After all those years, there's still a little bit of oil every now and then will seep out as a constant reminder that that is a, an actual grave site now of over 900 men who died on the Arizona on that day that lives in infamy. I want to begin our program with our, our focus here in another can't make this stuff up. So lots of times we use this as a point of humor to bring out just the sheer stupidity of things when you can't make it up. But we've been using this lately now to tell a story of the absolute idiocracy <laughs> of crazy people of what they're doing in America that makes absolutely no sense. For example, this is our story today. California COVID restrictions. Churches are closed. Strip clubs are open. Can't make this stuff up. We got a video that talks a little bit about it. Just let's play that video and I'll tell you a little bit when I come back. I just, I want you to know what's about to transpire uh, is Governor Mike Huckabee's fault. All right, we have even more left-wing hypocrisy on coronavirus tonight because while lockdown-loving California liberals tell everyone stay at home, lawmakers, California, they're off to Hawaii for a lavish getaway. And by the way, after a judge's ruling in San Diego earlier this month, Strip clubs are temporarily allowed to reopen. Churches, they have to conduct services <laughs> online outside. You can't make this up. It's not really funny, but you can't make it up. 
Now, religious liberty advocates believe the case could actually pave the way to lift the restrictions against houses of worship due to the First Amendment implications. By the way, can't you socially distance, have them outside? San Diego, it's warm, uh, and people wear masks. You can do those things, you know. Dr. Fauci told us. Anyway, far-left liberals, they're totally fine bending their own rules, even as their own residents suffer. You got Governor Gavin Newsom. He had to apologize after he violated his own restrictions by attending a party at a famous California restaurant. You got the Chicago mayor. Yes, not worried about all the violence. Recently spotted out in a large crowd celebrating Joe Biden. She canceled Thanksgiving for Chicago. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, remember her husband, busted trying to take his boat out during the summer lockdown and then using his wife's name. Here now, Fox News contributor Mike Huckabee, along with the author of the upcoming book, Modern Warriors, Real Stories from Real Heroes, which, by the way, he is one of, published first book, by the way, by Fox News Books, Fox and Friends Weekend co-host Pete Hegseth. Governor Huckabee, I don't know, hypocrisy. I would think that, you know, if you're going to open the strip club, it might apply to churches. I'm just guessing. I haven't been there. Stay away from those places. No good's coming out of that place. Right. Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with the strip clubs. I do have quite a bit of experience with churches <laughs> and generally they're a fairly safe place. And I would think that it's ridiculous to say that people are safer in a strip club than they are at church. They announced that their pastor will remove his tie during the sermon and therefore he will take off an article of clothing, making it a temporary strip club <laughs> so people will be able to go to church. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go away. By the way, um, Governor Huckabee said that he'd bail me out if I got arrested for that. So this, this is insane. Cannot America see the hypocrisy and the stupidity of all this? You're being lied to. And we are finished with your tyranny and we are going to enjoy Thanksgiving and we're gonna worship God. Open your churches. And that's what we've been doing here, opening our churches. So if all the pastors around the country, I mean, if you have a problem in your state, take off your tie. I wouldn't go with the music and all the dance and a little, little bizarre in church behind a pulpit, but showing the hypocrisy of what actually was taking place is just unbelievable. Now, let's put this in some context. Let's make some sense about what's going on and try to follow a, 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 a target. Because, see, the churches have been targeted for a reason. The Supreme Court now blocks New York from enforcing COVID limits on churches. Now, bear with me here because this is how we're going to build the story around what we're talking about today. The Supreme Court now has stopped New York from shutting down the churches. And that's primarily because of the movement of the Jewish communities up there. They have literally gotten into the street with thousands of people saying, we're not going to listen any further to this nonsense because of their constitutional rights. Splitting five to four, the Supreme Court backs the religions, religious challenge to Como's virus order shutdown. Now, is you can't shut down the churches. Now, this has changed because early in the year, it went the other way. Following this ruling out in California, where that church was that you just saw, they put out a new mandate shutting down the entire state for the next three to four weeks, with the exception of churches, and you ready for this, and protests. All other mandatory things you can go do if it's required, but you can't go out to your homes. You have to stay home unless you're protesting or going to church. Before, you could protest, but you couldn't go to church. Now, let's follow this through. 
Just as Amy, Amy Comey Barrett played a decisive role in this decision, which took the opposite approach of the earlier court rulings earlier this year while they were ruling against the church related to the coronavirus restrictions in California and Nevada. New York Governor Cuomo claimed that the decision reached by the Supreme Court was in large part political. Isn't that amazing? When it, when it goes their way, it's scientific. When it rules the other way, when it follows the Constitution, it's political. Let's play this video. The Supreme Court issuing an injunction that New York Governor Andrew Cuomo cannot enforce his new occupancy limits on religious institutions in his state. New Justice Amy Coney Barrett casting a deciding vote. Similar decisions before she came to the court in California and Nevada went the other way. Let's get more on that important ruling in New York with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, good to see you again. You were here back in spring when they were setting up field hospitals in Central Park, and now the state is facing a legal hurdle. Tell us about what happened overnight. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly, Chris. Well, Governor Andrew Cuomo has come under uh, some fire, and there's been some backlash here to the restrictions that are being imposed, not just on businesses and, uh, you know, as uh, and, you know, closing schools here in New York City, of course. Well, now we have this injunction overnight uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision, essentially blocking some of the stricter limits on houses of worship, uh, capacity of 10 or 25 people. Now, Chris, we should point out that the immediate impact of this ruling is, is not much because, as the state had argued, some of these restrictions had already been dialed back and that the houses of worship are allowed to operate at 50 percent capacity. But what this does highlight, Chris, is this uh, the impact of, as you mentioned, Amy Co Coney Barrett. She joined the, her conservative colleagues in this 5-4 opinion. Chief Justice John Roberts actually uh, joined the more liberal justices on the court. And again, the state had argued that th this injunction was not necessary because houses of worship uh, these restrictions were not actually in place because they've um, those houses of uh, worship are under less restrictive areas of New York City because of the coronavirus spread. But the court, in its unsigned majority opinion, said that these restrictions would violate religious freedom and that there's no evidence that these churches and synagogues actually contributed to the spread of COVID-19. Now, Chris, so far there has been no reaction this morning from Governor Cuomo's office, but again, a, a potentially significant ruling here as uh, houses of worship really across the country have, uh, you know, have said that they should not be singled out as these restrictions go, in, um, go into effect, Chris. Following this, this whole fiasco, the governor has now come out and said, no one's ever going to follow you in your home, in your churches to see what you have in the mandate behind how many people are actually working there. But they did ask for a task force to be developed to do that very thing. So you're just going to have to play as you go, pay attention to what's going on. So let's, take, let's make some sense of all of this. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 20, it says, Remember the word that I said to you, that the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours. Now that is a phrase that we are very well familiar with here in the, in the church. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now, we understand that. That phrase is very, very important as we go through in the years ahead before the return of Jesus Christ. While we understand that the persecution will come, as Jesus Christ said, sometimes we don't really consider how. How does that person, persecution actually come? Or let's put it another way. How do we as a free nation that has the church protected by the very first amendment that the government will not interfere with churches. How do we go from that to the persecution that's going to come upon the people of faith, especially the conservative church movement as we have here today? I want to take that now and show you how the beginning of these, this process is actually taking place right now before our very eyes. We find the example all the way back in the Bible again from Pontius Pilate in John 18, verse 31, it says, then Pilate said to them, take him and judge him according to your law. So somewhere it's going to be that the government said, hey, listen, our hands are off. This is something you guys have to do. All right. So judge him according to your law. And the Jews therefore said to him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. 
Oh, really? Is that, that's quite interesting that the Jews are saying, we can't put any man to death, right? That's what they're saying. That's the first thing that we need to understand that's going to come to pass. The second is, it's not lawful for us. So what we're looking at is find a way that as we go forward in the, in the movement against the church, you will find that the church people will align with the government to bring about the persecution because that's the way they did it with Jesus. They can't put anyone to death, but look what happened. John 8, 59. So then they took stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Picking up stones to throw at someone was to kill him. Why? Because they felt they had a law that justified what they were doing to kill someone. But before the government, they said, oh, we can't do that. You have to do that. How about John 10, verse 31? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Talking about trying to kill Jesus. And remember later, they conspired behind closed doors. How are they going to kill him? But they couldn't get past the popularity of the people. And remember when Jesus stepped in when they were about to kill the prostitute. Remember, Jesus stopped them from throwing the stones. They're going to kill her. So the fact that they say they, don't, they can't kill anybody was a ball-faced lie. And so we're going to be built around lies, conspiracies, and government intervention from churches to put the persecution on the true believers as we move into the end time. So if you watch for that to take place, remember Jesus says, what they did to me, they're going to do to you. So now we have the formation of what we begin to look for and the lies and the hypocrisy that we will see with church movements around the country who will go after the churches who will not stand for abortion and who will not stand for the gay movement and the marriages and the LGBTQ movement, period. The churches are going to help bring about the persecution itself by tying in with the government. Look at Daniel 24, verse Daniel 7, verse 24 and 25. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and it shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Here we're seeing as Daniel's prophecy right here in verse 25, tying in a religious leader at the end time who's going to come against the saints, the God's elect, who the, what we just, I just told you from what we've seen in, in, the, in the previous slide. And they will think to change times and laws. Now we see how they will begin to do it. Like right now they can't. The Constitution itself protects you and I. And the movement by uh, the Justice Amy Barrett, who just got put on, is a movement to the protection right now that this administration put in before he left. Why do you think there was so much animosity and hatred that was going in? Because this is one more step of protecting God's people to go further to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says, and they shall be given to his hand until time, times, and the dividing of time. So at some point in time, God's going to give us the protection we need. But it will begin to change until it brings about the persecution because God says they will be given into his hands. And God does that for a reason, to bring about the change in the, the, the hearts of many people to repentance. Because some people don't believe that that can happen today. And when they see the injustice, it changes their hearts. And they realize and brings them to conversion and repentance in most cases. So... How do we go from a free constitution society to the conditions of Daniel 7.25? Well, that's what we're talking about here. It goes to the point where they're going to wear out the saints of the Most High and they'll have to do change the laws to be able to get that accomplished. So that's what we're going to look at. The most important and the most egregious change will come from the change in the constitution. Now, this is important. Now, I'm going to show you now as we move in through how important it was and what a blessing God has given us as a church to be able to bring out seven years of timelines laying out histories of the former and latter, physical, spiritual, uh, and bringing all of these things together for our time today so that we can go back and look. 
because God says he's going to do nothing until he shows us. So we have now laid out before us what he's going to do. And how do we do it? He says, I'll tell you the end from the beginning. So we can go back to beginnings and see how God moves things along so that when we get to the end time, it's all laid out for us. So I'm going to bring in the timelines and show you how important this brings in. So now, how do, we, how do they do it? They have to change the Constitution. One of the ways to do it is what we've been hearing in the news recently is packing the Supreme Court. So packing the Supreme Court, that simply means they're going to put a whole bunch of judges in position to override what we have today of the nine so that they can reverse it from a conservative mindset to a liberal mindset. All right? So we've heard in that video, the one I just showed you a few minutes ago about the changes with Amy Barrett, we saw in that video how just one Supreme Court judge from a liberal judge to a conservative constitutional judge has already shown the difference in rulings and protecting us for going to church. When Justice Ginsburg was seated, the majority vote was to remove the First Amendment and the removal of protection for religious, uh, religious freedom. In that news clip, you remember, the newsman was saying it reversed earlier decisions by the Supreme Court. The earlier decisions was at the time when Judge Ginsburg was seated. It gave a five to four majority to the liberal side, not protecting the Christian. With the replacement of Amy Barrett, the decision was to uphold the First Amendment and the protection of the church. Now, what we're looking at here, this gives us a, a, a footing on what we're looking at going forward and why the packing, as you're looking at on the top of that slide, the packing of the Supreme Court is so important to the left because they know if they're going to change the laws like Daniel shows us in Daniel 7, 24 and 25, they have to change the law. And that's what they intend to do. So now let's talk about that for a second. If the Democrats win the two Georgia Senate seats, and if the presidential election remains as it is today, they will control the power to add more seats to the Supreme Court. Now, you wonder why there's so much, so much money going into Georgia? It's right there, two seats. What you would have is a 50-50 Senate divided completely right down the middle, and the vice president will make the deciding vote. And that would be Kamala Harris. And that would move to vote to bring in more Supreme Court justices. So look what Chuck Schumer says. First we win Georgia, then we change the nation. I don't know if you've paid attention how important that really is. That ought to be very alarming to the conservative Christian movement of what's coming. And that's why you're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars, probably the billions before it's over, to try to win at least one seat in Georgia to at least try to stem that change from taking place and slow it down, at least in this election. In the Supreme Court, it has been this way for quite a while now. After the president, Ulysses S. Grant, was elected in 1868, the Congress set the number at nine, and it has stayed there ever since. Now, Judge Ginsburg also is on record for not changing from the nine. So everybody says they want to obey her wishes, remember? And they said, don't put the judge in, don't put Barrett in. They want to obey her wishes. Forget it, because you see, when they said that, uh, Ginsburg is on record saying we don't want to change from nine. Forget that they're going to obey her wishes. They're going to do what they want to do. All right, so that's been that way ever since 1868. The last time the Supreme Court number of judges came in, anybody got any idea when that was? It's been nine ever since 68. But the last time it was attempted to change, 1937. In 1937, who's the president? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the one who was what doing what? Changing the Constitution. It was the very first time in the Constitution that you could take money from you and give it to you. You couldn't take it from one citizen and give it to another. That was unconstitutional. So what he began doing was putting in laws, mandates, that he knew was unconstitutional, but by the time they reached the Supreme Court, 
to throw it out, he done had a new one put in place. And so he did that for a lot of years, and he wanted to change the bill. The bill was called the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill of 1937, referred to as court packing. So you wonder where the name comes from? It comes from right here in this bill. It was an effort to get the New Deal. It's amazing how God shows us the form and ladder. Here we have the New Deal coming in to do what? Change the Constitution. So here we are again. What are we looking at? We're at the same crossroad they were then changing the Constitution. This time it's called the Green New Deal. Again, being brought about by left. And what do they want to do? Change the Constitution. For this to take place, the Constitution actually has to take, has to take place. To accomplish, to accomplish the implementation of the Green New Deal, it will require changing the Constitution of the United States. Whether we realize it or not, that is what's coming. That's why my sermon I'm talking about this coming week, the nation who got what it asked for. So now, what's the objective of these changes for the Green New Deal? It's called the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. It is part of the 2030 agenda that's being established by the Pope. The implementation of the SDG in America will require the changes in the Constitution. Why is that important? Why is the Pope coming in, laying all this down? Remember Daniel 7, where we went with 24 and 25, a religious person who's going to come in and who's going to have the power to make the changes and to change the laws. That's what you're seeing coming. To, these are fulfillment of biblical prophecies taking place in your day. That's what we're looking at right now. We better wake up and pay attention to what's coming. For the SDG to work, the nations will need to relinquish their own national identity to work on the globalism and nationalism. Now, pay attention to this, releasing your national identity. That's part of the captivity in the waves that Israel went into captivity in ancient Israel. With just under 10 years to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, world leaders at the SDG Summit in September 2019 about a year ago, called for a decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. They planned to mobilize financing, enhance the, enhance the national implementation, and strengthen institutions to achieve the goals by the target date 2030, leaving no one behind. Why have they slowed down? Because they needed financing. And this administration, who's in power now, going out, pulled all the financing out, and it slowed down their goal. Going in, the Green New Deal, as we're going to call it, is, is talking about starting with $2 trillion of your taxpayer money. $2 trillion, $2 trillion now to get this accomplished. They're also talking about adding $3 trillion for more aid to everybody here in America. So going in, we're looking at the possibility of the first year and the minimum of $5 trillion to our debt. With a T, the nation who got what it asked for. That's what's coming. In America, it all begins with the Green New Deal. Now, those on the far left said that $2 trillion is not even close to being enough. They want to start with at least $5 trillion, and to accomplish their goals in the next 10 years, they need $94 trillion to accomplish something that's impossible. just can't be done. So now, to begin to work under the U.N. resolutions, it will require the U.S. Constitution to be changed. It will require us to release some of our own governance. What does that mean? Our own national identity. That's where we're going through. Relinquishing self-governance introduces two grave dangers. First, it follows the same pattern of going into captivity as ancient Israel. And two, it removes the protections of the conservative Christian afforded them by the Constitution. And you're going to see that all beginning to take place. So now, now we get to the timeline. I'm going to show you how important these timelines have been. Because as I explain where we're going, God's already laid it out for us. All we need to do is understand what he did and to be able to have the spirit of prophecy. In other words, God guiding and directing us and telling us from the past where we are today. 
That's why all these things were able to put in place step by step, piece by piece as we go forward. What you're looking at here is three scriptures that I've seen, uh, that I've laid out for you. These are the three scriptures that isolate and pinpoint the movement of the three stages of captivity of ancient Israel. So the first was 1745 is where the very first was, is where they took their money and they paid tribute to the king to not come in and take them captive. They paid them money. So the first thing is the loss of the finances. All right, that is the beginning of the removal of Israel's wealth and resources was the very first thing of captivity. And that's what we've been witnessing here in America over the last who knows how many years, at least 10, 15 years to continue removal, but none as fast as it has been in 2020. Ever since COVID, we have seen the amount of money rise unbelievable in one single year. In 7, 732 B.C. is the beginning of the loss of governance. Remember I talk about their identity? That is the second phase of captivity. And then, of course, the, first, the third is the complete removal of the identity of Israel. They didn't exist. And the Israel has been in the lost tribes ever since. They've never found their homeland completely since that removal. Now, just as a way of a side note, if, if you're new to Bible study, you realize that there was what the Bible calls the 2,520 years, the seven times seven or seven, seven times seven years. And it shows you the captivity that they would be, as God shows us the warnings in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy of blessings and cursings, that if you continue to ignore me, I'll bring seven times more, God says. And then if they don't listen seven times more, God goes on specifically to name those things. So as God began to restore an end time Israel today, which we believe is the United States and Great Britain, all right, the two sons of, Ephra, of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, where God says, and this is another study altogether, so I'm just giving it real briefly, is God says, I will place my name, Jacob's name, which was changed to Israel, on those two nations. And if you follow the blessings that were laid out, the United States and Great Britain fulfills that promise to, to, from Jacob in uh, Genesis 49. So now, so we begin to see the identity is coming back, even though the Amer the America doesn't know who they are. Isaiah says, my people don't know, they don't know who they are. The ox knows who the owner is, but he says, my people don't. So here we are, the beginning of the restoration, 1776, to become the wealthiest, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. In 1789, the Constitution, well, then you say, well, the Constitution was established in 1787. That's when it was established. It was not implemented completely to two years later. It's also the first year that we had governance as a president. George Washington, 1789, in the beginning of the fulfillment of the destiny of America in 1803. Each one of these is 2,520 years to the day, to, to the year that the fulfillment took place. So now, God says, before he returns, that there would be another captivity. So now we're beginning to see that captivity before the return of Jesus Christ. What's the three ways? The first one is the removal of Israel's wealth. Well, we're there now. What is the second? This nation, through the vote of what it just witnessed right now, whether it was real or stolen, I believe it was stolen. They can't prove it all, but there's so much evidence out there that nobody really on the left wants to talk about it or examine what was going on. But either way, it looks like it's a done deal. This, the second is the loss of their own governance. It would take a left movement, a very liberal movement, to be able to bring in another governance and re begin to remove our identity. It brings us to what's next, the actual removal of the United States itself. Is any, is any power that's going to be at the end time. So now, the sustainable de development goals is what's coming in. This is what's important. It was established in 2015 by the Pope, brought in at the UN. The UN is the governing body that's going to put this into place. That was the first introduction to a single global UN objective to achieve 17 points, which now stands at two spearheads. Two spearheads. This is very important. I believe this is the first time you're hearing this. In fact, I don't think I've read it anywhere, to be honest with you. What are the two spearheads? The Pope understands that the culture of the mind will not let the nations come together on their own. You realize that? They've seen this, 
because of COVID. When COVID struck, what did every nation do? They all hunkered down and became individualized once again. They've seen that kind of movement. So the Pope knows going in, because it's been divinely given from way back in the Old Testament, that it would take a religious person to pull this all together. So here we have the beginning of the establishment, the two spearheads, the two beasts. You're right now at the very formation of the two beasts coming together, beginning to wake up. The second is what's called the Pope's encyclical. So the Pope understands this beast, the woman that's going to ride this scarlet beast, is going to direct the government agencies that's going to take place. However, there comes a time that he's taken out. But you're looking right now at the beginning of the formation with the two beasts, two separate powers beginning to rise up that's going to accomplish the end time movement. The second spearhead, which is the Pope. I'm going to begin that with that first. Pope Francis' religious and political leaders were a single global pact on education, the beginning of the Pope's world re-education process in Rome. By the way, here's another side note. Do you realize the left now are taking and saying that all Trump supporters need to be put in re-education camps? Did you hear about that? That's what happened in Germany when Hitler took over. They had to take those who did not agree with Hitler or his regime, and they began moving them into what they called re-education camps. They were concentration camps. They were prison camps. The prisons were built and filled long before the Jews were put in. It was against the political, what they would call dissidents, that didn't agree with their policy. And so now you hear rumblings, even right now, of those who are dissidents who don't agree with the administration coming in, putting them in re-education camps. Pay attention to what's going on. It ought to make everyone wide awake. The first spearhead, of course, is what we've been talking about, is the Great Reset, which beginning in Davos, what they're going to begin developing is the Great Reset. One of the items we must look at is the programs implemented during 20 the, during the COVID-19 crisis on society. They want to see how we may be able to use things that are going on right now in other areas for the Great Reset. Now, I'm going to show you something that wouldn't happen in Canada. It's about two and a half to three minutes long or so. So pay attention to what's playing. Let's play this video. Look it up. The Great Reset here. The Great Reset. And you Shame on you! 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 Shame on
That's the restaurant owner that they're arresting. If you're wondering what his crime was, he opened up. He opened his restaurant when the government said, you can't be open. And that was the people who were supporting him. And off to jail, he goes. You don't think it can happen here in America? Think again. These things are changing, and God says the laws are going to change. The Vermont governor, Phil Scott, has asked teachers, tell me if this doesn't sound eerily reminiscent to pre-war Germany. Phil Scott asked teachers to have the kids report parents if they weren't obeying the COVID rules after the Thanksgiving break. This was his tweet. Unfortunately, we know some still get together and schools have asked for help. The VTE education will direct schools to ask students or parents if they were part of a multifamily gathering. And if the answer is yes, they'll need to go and remote to uh, go remote for seven, 14 to seven days, at least for a test for COVID. Unbelievable. So in other words, this is a, this is a general way of saying, we want you to tell us what happened in your home while you're on break. Now, this is going to the, to the youth. And they're trying to show if the parents are, are not a listening, they want the kids to report on them. And they're not making this up. But this happened in America. This shows you the mindset of what's changing, of what's taking place even here in America. All right. We'll talk a lot more about that in, in, uh, in the year ahead because we're only at the beginning of all of this right now. So when we come back, we're going to go into 20 to 1260 days and the removal of the Constitution. Now, I'm going to go through kind of quick because I want to come back to it next week because I'm going to be out of time. I wanted to spend most of my time laying the foundation of why the Constitution is so important, why we're having so many arguments about the Constitution, why the packing is coming in, and show you how that all ties into Bible prophecy that you're living through today. Now, I won't have much time to go through the second part of the program, but I wanted the, you to hear that today to absorb what's going on, and we're going to go back into next week the timelines, the 1260 days, and I'll just give you a little introduction of that today. All right, so now when we come back, we'll go right to that. So now let's take a break, a little short video here. The Ten Commandments. I'll be right back. Welcome back. All right, so now we're going to get into just the introduction to what I'm going to be talking about, the 1260 days, because this is important. And now you're going to begin to see, because it's difficult to understand where prophecy takes you until it's actually happening, and you begin to see what's taking place. But now we're moving into a time that's going to be uh, utmost important to understand what Bible, the Bible prophecies bring about, the 1260 days and the removal of the Constitution. Because I talked about this some years back at the beginning area of our timeline series. It's called the Holy Roman Revival. And this is what we're going to be talking about. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. 
And the woman were given two wings. This is verse 14. So what I did is almost like it's a repeat, but it's not. It's the duality of events. From verse 6 to verse 14, it says again, And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, which she had nourished for a time, times and a half time from the face of the serpent. So here what we have, God's talking about two different events, same timeline, same amount of time, former and latter of what we're looking at. And here we're talking about a time that's coming down the road. It's going to come on all of God's people. It's going to be a time where you're looking at right now is the very first slide that we'll be going into next week just to show you an idea. And how does it all begin? Right there, persecution. And what did God say at the end time? That God's elect are going to be put into her hands. And what happens with that when the persecution comes? It spreads the gospel to other people. So keep that in mind. Next week, we're going to pick up basically right here. I'm going to pick up the slide I just showed you in the Holy Roman Revival. We're going to show you how events today that are changing how laws are coming in, the, the beginning of two beasts formulating, taking place, and showing how it all ties in to God's plan to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ through persecution. So, so you don't want to miss next week. It's really, really important. In fact, as we was going through some of the slides, it may take us a few weeks to get through this because it's critical that we as a church understand what, the, what people don't understand in, in, in the world, much less in the churches themselves, they confuse places of safety to three and a half years, what's going to be taking place, raptures. All of this is tied into all of what I'm telling you today. All right, so we'll go to that next week. So now, from the home office, let's begin to wrap up our program now. From the home office, uh, videos that went out this past week, uh, Tap into the Power by Josh Hunt up from uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, Chuck Hunt Jr.'s brother, the... We call them the dynamic duo of the North, the two brothers that are up there uh, doing God's work. And the sermon that I delivered about a month ago, 2020, with the question, is this how it begins? That went out in the mail. So if you're not on the mailing list, please get on the mailing list. We just also put out this week the, the December newsletter is be careful what you ask for. It's a little introduction to the sermon that I'm delivering tomorrow that's going to be going out, the nation that asked what, uh, got what it asked for. And also this month, the card that went out, the choice. We all have choices to make. And it's going to be very important, the choice we make going forward, that we choose God's way, not man's. The choice, Egypt or the promised land. We'll talk about the historical events of the past to show you how important they are today. Services this Sabbath. So tomorrow, if you don't have anywhere to go, all right, and you're looking for a service you can meet with, I'm going to be talking about this sermon tomorrow, God willing, it live streams, the nation that got what it asked for. So now when we look at what's going on, I'm, I'm trying what to tell you or not what to tell you coming in because I don't have it completed yet as I'm still developing it in my mind. But there's something I want to tell us about this. In, in December 7th, 1941, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor that, that brought us into war. I believe what I'm looking at from this election, because there's so many things that are taking place out there that are obvious to look at all the, the hypocrisies, the lies, the, the findings that they won't let into to court. Are we witnessing a spiritual Pearl Harbor on this nation today. Just, just want you to think about that. Because there's so much going on, and I'm going to isolate some of the things in the sermon, and I'm going to show you that the war that's beginning to take place now is beginning to move the concept of how a nation thinks. The nation that got what it asked for. Tomorrow. If you have nowhere to go, tune in. If not, you can always watch this. It'll be online later on, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. All right, let's wrap our program up, and as we do each week, we close with uh, a little inspirational video, and today is a very thought-provoking video. 
Something to think about as we go forward, which ties into everything we're talking about today, America's religious freedoms. Let's play that video, and I'll be right back to close our program. While this nation doesn't yet have the truth and they don't understand the cross, Christmas, or nativity, there are some who have put this video together who have at least a God conscience to try to understand that at least keep God in the picture. The time is going to come in that you and I in all of God's churches will set the record straight that Christmas and Easter is pagan. They existed long before Jesus Christ. But the point we're trying to make here that there is at least some who are trying to follow their conscience to follow God, those will be some of those who will be called as the innumerable multitude. In the meantime, we will pray that God will continue to open their minds to understand the true faith of Jesus Christ that he has given to each of us as he called us out of this world. All right, I was tempted whether to show that video or not. I said, well, that's going to turn some people off if I leave that in. But I wanted to bring about the importance because, you see, God's calling those people into the truth. And you and I were there where they are today. All righty, from all of us up here, right here, God's Unchanging Word, we want to thank you for watching. We want to thank you for giving us a great year, for expanding the work and sharing this with everybody you know. And as we tell you each and every week, be sure to share this with everyone you know. They're going to love you for it or not. Till next week, God be with you.